Namaste. So it's a nice, cool, rainy, silent Saturday afternoon in Sri Lanka. Rainy season has finally set in. And this time of the year is traditional in Sri Lankan society as a time for retirement and tapasya. It's called the rains. Huh? And one of the things they ask you, one of the monks will ask you the first time you go in a temple and they meet you for the first time, how many rains do you have? In other words, how many years have you been performing tapasya, austerity? Because this is a best indication of your seniority as a monk. And I was always able to tell them, well, I've been doing this since I was 24 years old. So that's what, more than 50 years now. Oh, you're a mahatero, means a great monk. That's the fruit. But what about the process itself? How does one become a mahatero? How does one become advanced in spiritual insight? Through tapasya. Now, we've been over this a bunch of times, that enlightenment, self-realization, is not the result of any kind of doing because it is already our nature. We don't have to do anything. We simply have to recognize it. But there's a problem. We have these upadis, these limiting adjuncts that block our vision, that create a false image, a false identity, a false idea of who we are. So to erase these and to realize our real self, our original identity as Brahman, our enlightenment and our nirvana, our nibbana, as it's called here. We have to perform tapasya, austerities. And there's a wonderful passage in chapter 17 of the Bhagavad Gita describing this process of austerity. Let's take a read through it. It's only four verses. And then discuss it in detail. Worship of the devas, the twice-born, the gurus and the wise, and purity, rectitude, continence, and non-injuriousness are called austerity of the body. Speech, which causes no excitement and is true, as also agreeable and beneficial, and also the practice of sacred recitation, are said to form the austerity of speech, serenity of mind, kindliness, silence, self-control, purity of heart. This is called the mental austerity. This, the threefold austerity practiced by steadfast men with great shraddha, desiring no fruit, they call sattvic. Well, this is wonderful advice for anyone, but especially for those who are pursuing self-realization. Now, when they say, which is not performed for fruit, that means material fruit. We're not doing it for fame, for recognition, for any position or title or praise. We're not looking for any reward in this world. Simply, we are focused on the process itself because it leads to self-realization. The cultivation of sattva, the mode of goodness, means performing only actions that lead to self-realization. So let's take a look at some of these processes, some of these practices, and try to understand them in the light of contemporary society. Worship of the devas means we worship some form of God, whether it's a demigod 
or an incarnation of God, or Shiva or Shakti, or Brahman, some form of God, the Tao, the Great Father, the Great Mother. It could be anything, even nature. But we have to pick a higher power to worship and offer our homage to. This is a very important principle. I don't know anyone who has reached authentic self-realization without devoting a substantial portion of their lives to this kind of worship. Another thing is the worship of the twice born. What does this mean? The initiates, the brahmanas, those who are focused on realization of Brahman. Now, nowadays, people in India especially will, you know, get some sacred thread and then, you know, go and open a shop or get a job with the government or <laughs> go to university and become a software developer or some nonsense. But that's not really what it's all about. A brahmana means someone who is dedicated to Brahman. Worship of Brahman is the highest worship because it leads to the highest moksha, realization of the self, realization of Brahman. So other verses in the Bhagavad Gita state, I created these four divisions of society, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaisha, Shudra, according to quality and work. So you can be wearing a sacred thread and be born in an ostensibly Brahman family. But if you're working in a shop, you're a sudra. Your quality, you know, you may be taking intoxication, eating meat, you know. A lot of so-called Brahmanas are eating chicken now in India. This is sinful. This is not Brahmana. This is a sense enjoyer, a bogey, not a yogi. A yogi is austere. What does that mean? He has a guru. He worships his guru. This also is a very important fundamental principle of spiritual life. One must have a guru. One must take initiation from the guru and serve the guru. Not that he just comes once to your family home and does some mumbo jumbo and a little ceremony and then gives you a sacred thread and a mantra. That's not initiation. Initiation is something you have to earn by service over a significant period of time, minimum one year. This is stated in the Shastra that the guru and the disciple should test each other for a minimum of one year before giving or accepting initiation or discipleship. So worship of the guru and the wise, the sages, both past and present. There are many sages given in the scriptures who provide wonderful, wise advice, and we should structure our lives accordingly. That is the actual worship of the sages, not simply, you know, waving some incense at a picture. That's token. That's trivial. That's only external. The real worship of the sages is following their instructions. Then what? Purity. No intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, and no sex. Celibacy. This is what leads to purity. This is how you become a monk. This is how you become wise. This is how you become realized. You have to be austere. Austerity. Tapasya. Tapasya means tapas, means taking trouble for the cause of self-realization. But not impure tapas. Uh, we'll talk about that towards the end of the video. Rectitude. Rectitude means self-restraint. One does not become angry. One does not become upset. One does not lose control of one's speech, but is always self-controlled. 
This is rectitude. Continence, we already covered, that's celibacy. And non-injuriousness. Huh? One does not go around kicking dogs <laughs> or otherwise hurting living entities. There's a wonderful story about this. Once there was a so-called Brahmana who came across a dog sleeping on the path. And he kicked the dog angrily out of his way. He said, get out of my way, you miserable mutt. And then he went on his way. So the dog, this was during the reign of King Rama in Ayodhya. So the dog went to the king and he filed a complaint against this Brahmana. So the Brahmana was summoned and he came. Then the, the Brahmana told the truth. Yes, I admit it. I got angry. I kicked the dog. I'm sorry. So Rama turned to the dog and said, well, what do you think should be the penalty? And he said, my dear Lord, I think you should appoint him as the head of such and such a monastery. And Rama says, well, that doesn't sound like a punishment. How is that going to help anything? So the dog said, in my previous life, I was the head of that monastery. And because of my abuses of the devotees, now I have become a dog. So let's give him the position and see how well he handles it and what are the consequences. Knowing that this guy has such a temper, he's certainly going to offend the devotees and fall down. So these all are called austerity of the body. Why is that? Because they militate against unrestricted sense enjoyment. Unrestricted sense enjoyment is the wide road to hell. Trust me, <laughs> I have experience. I've seen so many thousands of would-be sadhus get a little good karma. And just like someone who inherits some money, then goes off and blows it on partying. I've seen them waste their good karma on mere sense enjoyment, forget all about spiritual life and fall down. So this is the opposite <laughs> of austerity of the body. Austerity of the body means you take some trouble for spiritual life. Intentional suffering, as Gurdjieff called it, that you don't lead a comfortable life, especially at others' expense like in a monastery or a temple. But you take some trouble. You try to teach. You try to study and understand these things deeply and practice them in your life. That is the key. So next is austerity of speech. Speech which causes no excitement. Now, if we look on the internet, we'll see thousands, if not millions of harmful speech, which is designed to cause excitement. Clickbait, huh? to get you all excited about something. Hype, to get you to where you would invest and sink money into some company on the outside chance that they might make a fortune. But this is not good speech. This is harmful speech because it misleads people. Look at all the nonsense about so-called AI right now. Well, I could make a video just on this topic because it's not really AI. It's simply statistical analysis of speech patterns, that's all. So real intelligence is something much higher than that. Simple word knowledge is something any parrot can cultivate. But a really wise person has to understand the meaning Speech which is true, agreeable, and beneficial. That's the kind of speech we want. And also the practice of sacred recitation, mantras, and also reading of the scripture, such as we're doing right here in the videos and in our other series on the Brahma Sutra. Now, these are called austerity of speech because we don't just blab out anything that comes to mind. 
We keep control of our speech and we speak only things that are in the mode of goodness, sattva. This will bring us to what is called vaksiddhi. Vaksiddhi means that whatever we speak becomes true. So there's another story about this. One time during their exile in the forest, the Pandavas went to a Svayamvara where the king's daughter is offered to the different brahmanas and kshatriyas in marriage. But she gets to pick the husband. So she picked Arjuna. Uh, this was Draupadi. She picked Arjuna. So then the Pandavas came home with Draupadi, the daughter of King Drupada, and they told their mother, Kunti, hey, mom, <laughs> look what we got today in alms. Right? Because they were dressed as brahmanas and therefore begging for their food. Now, she was cooking and had her back turned and without turning around and looking said, well, whatever you have got for alms, make sure and share it equally with your brothers. And they all went, <gasps> <laughs> and then Kunti turned around and said, uh-oh, what did I just say? But then Vyasadeva showed up and he said, it's okay, she can marry all five of them. They're all self-realized, they won't abuse her. So that's what happened. That's how Draupadi became the wife of all the five Pandavas. <laughs> so speech which is true leads to Vaksiddhi such that whatever one says is the truth. Then there's mental austerity, serenity of the mind. Not that the mind is jumping or agitated or extremely passionate and desiring this and that, but is calm, focused, controlled. One's attention span is long and broad. Kindliness. In other words, one does not blame others. Whatever happens, one understands is due to my karma. I created the causes for this in my previous life. So even if something bad happens, or even if something terrible is done to me, I accept it kindly, graciously. This is a lost art in these days. Silence, not speaking unless absolutely necessary. I live here in a nice, comfortable house, and I'm home all alone most of the time. Silence, I love silence. And especially these rainy days when there's nobody riding around in cars and motorcycles, no dogs barking, Huh? No chatter, chit-chat, you know, between the neighbors, ladies. <laughs> I love it. I even built a room, my studio, which is completely soundproof. Silence leads to meditation. And then self-control and purity of heart. One does not cultivate evil desires or what to speak of, act on them. But one acts only for the purpose of self-realization. These are the austerities, the triple austerities of body, speech, and mind that lead to self-realization. And one should practice these because they clear the upadis that cloud our vision of our real self. This is the key to full enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.